how every NFC team can win the Super Bowl in 2024. No matter what team you're a fan of, we could all use some optimism. So just like I did for the AFC, here's the best case scenario for every team in the NFC, no matter how unrealistic some of them may be. The Dallas Cowboys. Someone needs to lie to them about when the playoffs actually start. You know that strategy where if you have a friend that's always late, you tell them to get there like an hour before you actually want them there because that's the only way to get them to show up on time? That's what we have to do to the Cowboys if we want them to actually perform in the playoffs. All regular season, they're great. They look like one of the best teams in the league. They look like it might actually be their year. And then the pressure of the playoffs just absolutely cooks them because at this point, they know how unsuccessful they've been in the playoffs over the last 30 years. And it's weighing on them. As soon as it sets in that they're in a playoff game, they tense up, they make mistakes, and they allow 48 points at home to the Green Bay Packers. A defense that was elite all season just completely abandoned them at the most important time. They really said, hey, we're going out for some milk. We'll be right back. They never came back. The way I see it, the only way to get them to play like they did in the regular season is to make them think it's still the regular season. Have no one in the organization tell them when the playoffs start. Just tell them the regular season's been extended to 21 games and that the last four opponents are TBD because of flex scheduling or ratings or something. Now, if they make the Super Bowl, it might be a little tough to explain why it's at a neutral site and why they have so many media responsibilities and why Miley Cyrus is performing at halftime, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it because honestly, I have no other solutions. The Philadelphia Eagles. Their hard reset with their coordinators actually pays off. The Eagles essentially did what every Every tech support person will tell you to do first and foremost when everything is going wrong. Turn it off and turn it back on again. From a roster construction perspective, the Eagles have what it takes to win a Super Bowl, but everything went wrong down the stretch last year because they had the wrong guys leading the way on both sides of the ball. Now look, a downgrade is to be expected when you're trying to replace two coordinators who were so good the year prior that they both got poached for head coaching jobs. But you can't swing and miss as bad as the Eagles did with Brian Johnson and Sean Desai, and then Matt Patricia who took over defensive play calling duties in December because Desai was so bad. Guess what? Patricia wasn't any better. But now, as we head into 2024, the Eagles are completing their reset by booting up Kellen Moore as offensive coordinator and Vic Fangio as defensive coordinator, which I think is super smart. Because while neither of these guys are going to light the world on fire, they're safe picks, which is all you need when you have a roster this talented. The Eagles aren't trying to hit a home run with these hires. They're just trying to get on base so their players can do the rest. The Washington Commanders. Jaden Daniels carries the franchise like Madame Zeroni up a mountain with a little help from Cliff Kingsbury. I'm on record that I don't like the Dan Quinn hire. I think he's just the physical manifestation of mediocrity. But I don't completely hate the Kingsbury hire. Because you want to know what happened the last time Cliff Kingsbury was given a mobile rookie quarterback in the NFL? He made Kyler Murray the offensive rookie of the year. So I don't necessarily think he's a bad choice to develop Jaden Daniels. With that said, he's going to have to do a lot more than develop him for the Commanders to win a Super Bowl. He's going to need to turn him into Lamar Jackson mixed with Jalen Hurts mixed with God himself. And although I don't think the skill group here is bad, the offensive line is definitely a question mark. So Daniels is going to have to embrace running the same way the folks in Jurassic Park did. As in, he's probably going to have to do it for his life. But hey, if he becomes the most dangerous dual threat quarterback the world has ever seen and the defense can go from literally the worst in the league to a net positive, the commanders could totally win a Super Bowl. You know what's crazy is this wasn't even the most difficult team to make an argument for in this division. The New York Giants send their entire roster to Guatemala and replace them with guys off the street. Except Malik Neighbors, he can stay. Look, I can stretch a lot of teams into at least a somewhat plausible scenario where they can win a Super Bowl. The Giants aren't one of them which is why we need to give them a completely new team and just reshuffle the deck. Who knows, maybe they stumble upon the next Kurt Warner working at a grocery store somewhere. All I know is it's better to take a chance on that happening than Daniel Jones actually making a positive impact, especially with a desolate supporting cast, outside of Malik Neighbors. If we really get down to it, the D-line can probably stay too. Dexter Lawrence, Brian Burns, and Kayvon Thibodeau are a nice group, but unless they combine for 75 sacks this season, it's not really gonna matter. That's why I'm proposing a completely fresh start and removing any traces of the giant stink before we rebuild. Neighbors can stay because he's a rookie, so it probably hasn't rubbed off on him too much, yet. And I know what you might be thinking, can't we say the same about Brian Burns? He just got here too. And yes, but he has the Panthers stink, which might be even worse. So start scouting your local supermarkets, Giants fans. We got a team to build. The Detroit Lions actually succeed at plugging the massive leaky hole in their secondary. Phil Swift, where you at? I mentioned in my biggest needs video that the Lions have, thankfully, taken steps to address their biggest flaw from 2023. That being a secondary that allowed the sixth most passing yards in the league. And it's great that they took those steps, but now they need these guys to actually perform. Again, they signed Amik Robertson, traded for Carlton Davis, and drafted Terry and Arnold and Ennis Rakestraw Jr. So they overhauled their cornerback group about as much as you possibly can. Meaning they've got a pretty good shot at solving their problem, even if only half these guys work out. Other than that, they're about as well-rounded of a team as you'll find. I mean, there's a reason they were a quarter away from a Super Bowl appearance last year. Ben Johnson sticking around, they have the best offensive line in the league, one of the best skill groups in the league, one of the best D-lines in the league. It would be crazy to say this sentence a few years ago, but it wouldn't be at all surprising to see Detroit hoisting a Lombardi at the end of the season. The Green Bay Packers. Josh Jacobs ends up not being completely washed. The Packers 
Packers are a pretty well-rounded group too. Their receiver room that we thought was full of nobodies turned out to be chock full of talent. Jordan Love showed in the second half of the season that he's a capable franchise quarterback. The line's good, the defense is good, and they used all these things to, as I mentioned before, bop the Cowboys in the playoffs. This team is already ascending as it is, so they didn't make a ton of big changes this offseason. But the one change they did make was a little surprising. They moved on from their longtime running back Aaron Jones and replaced him with Josh Jacobs. Now, Jacobs is interesting because he was buns last year. His lack of efficiency and inability to break a single tackle would normally be telltale signs that he's hitting the age cliff, except for the fact that he was 25 last season. So was that dip in production just because he was on a bad Raiders team and possibly unmotivated? Or was it a sign of things to come? If the Packers are gonna win a Super Bowl this year, they're gonna need the running back that they're paying $12 million a year to not be washed. Or Marshawn Lloyd can just be nasty and pick up the slack. That'd be cool too. The Minnesota Vikings do their best Texans and Jets impression by having both the offensive and defensive rookies of the year. The Vikings were only a borderline contender when they still had Kirk Cousins. Now that he's gone, they're gonna need these young bucks to pick up a lot of slack if they wanna pull a Super Bowl out of their big purple behinds. That starts with JJ McCarthy, who will need to have Stroud levels of productivity as a rookie for the Vikings to have any shot at a championship. And while that's obviously unlikely, he at least has the right group of receivers to give him a shot. Defensively, they'll need Dallas Turner to take home that hardware because while the Vikings defense isn't bad, it's got a long way to go before it's a unit you're truly afraid of. But if they get defensive rookie of the year production out of Dallas Turner on top of double digit sacks from Jonathan Grenard and one of the better safety groups in the league, we might be getting somewhere. And sorry to anyone who wanted me to speak on Sam Darnold in this section, but Sam Darnold and Super Bowl do not belong in the same sentence, not even hypothetically. I would throw out a hypothetical where CJ Ham quarterbacks this team to a Super Bowl before I did it with Sam Darnold. Shout out Ham God. The Chicago Bears. Caleb Williams has the best rookie quarterback season of all time, and they get Montez Sweat some help so he doesn't have to sweat his balls off carrying the D-line by himself. When it comes to Caleb, I said the same thing about CJ Stroud in last year's edition of the AFC version of this video, that he'd have to have the best rookie quarterback season of all time for the Texans to win a Super Bowl. And while Stroud didn't actually do either of those things, he got way closer than I thought he would. So maybe Caleb can too. After all, on paper, he's set up way better than Stroud was. Caleb's stepping into a team with arguably the best receiving core in the NFL. So I don't think it's out of the question that he has a better rookie season than Justin Herbert, who had the best statistical rookie quarterback season back in 2020. On the other side of the ball, the Bears need someone else to step up and help Montez Sweat. Chicago traded for Sweat at the deadline last year, and he went on to record six sacks in nine games. And those six sacks that he got in nine games led the team over guys that played there all season. Man has no help. Sweat was a savvy addition for a team that might find itself contending sooner rather than later, but if they wanna contend this year, they can't make this man carry an entire D-line on his own. He's good, but he's not Aaron Donald. Before we move on to the NFC West, if you're enjoying this video, do me a favor and click that like button. It helps me out a lot. And if you're new here, be sure to subscribe and ring that little bell so you never miss an upload. The NFL season's almost here and we've got a lot of content on the way. Love you, thank you, let's keep going. The San Francisco 49ers. Kyle Shanahan developed some kind of clutch gene. I know with it being a gene, you technically can't develop it. You just have to be born with it. But the Niners have enough money that I'm sure they could get some scientists to work on it. The Niners have all the pieces in place to win a Super Bowl, which should be obvious considering they got to one last year. But this is three times now that Shanahan has choked in a Super Bowl. Bowl, twice with the 49ers and once with the Atlanta Falcons in what was quite literally the biggest choke in the history of professional sports. And when I say he's choked three times, I'm not just saying that because he got to the Super Bowl and then couldn't finish the job. I'm saying that because he had all three games won and actively gave them away. Since 28-3, the Niners' two Super Bowl appearances with Shanahan have featured his team giving up 21 unanswered points in the fourth quarter after entering that quarter with a 10-point lead, and then four years later going to overtime with a plan that essentially involved letting the Chiefs control their own destiny by getting the ball second. Shanahan's an amazing game planner and play caller like 99% of the time, but when he gets into pressure situations, it's like it all falls apart. He's gotta fix that if the Niners are gonna win a Super Bowl. The Los Angeles Rams employ a committee approach on defense to replace a guy who's pretty irreplaceable. Against all odds, this offense is already Super Bowl caliber. And I say against all odds because other than Cooper Cup, this offense was projecting to be pretty mid last season until Kyron Williams and Puka Nakua just materialized out of nowhere to become top 10 players at their position. I still think Stafford's got enough left in the tank, the offensive line's good enough, and Sean McVay's still roaming the sidelines. So offensively, they're set. Defensively, Slightly different story because they're trying to replace a future Hall of Famer. The Rams were already below average defensively. They were 19th in points allowed and 20th in yards allowed. So they're at risk of their defense becoming a major liability instead of a minor one. That's why they're gonna need multiple guys to step up and figure this thing out. Can the Florida State boys generate even a fraction of the pressure Aaron Donald once did? Can their rebuilt secondary of Darius Williams, Tredavious White, and Cameron Curl turn their pass defense into their biggest strength? Either way, someone's gotta do something if the Rams wanna make the most out of their last few years with Matthew Stafford. The Seattle Seahawks get saved by the Huskies. Ow, ow, ow! Sorry. 
There are two very important Huskies joining the team this year. First is former Washington Husky and new Seahawks offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb. Shane Waldron kind of overstayed his welcome in Seattle. He used to be thought of as an innovative offensive mind, but by the end of his time there, fans were just mad he refused to use JSN beyond the line of scrimmage. So in comes Ryan Grubb, a guy who has no NFL experience but has been praised for, A, his downfield passing attack, which is good because another criticism of Waldron was he didn't take enough deep shots, and B, his ability to get the ball to his best players. Both Grubb and Mike McDonald have already talked about moving DK Metcalf all over the formation and getting him the ball. A ton. And that kind of creativity should bode well for JSN, too. Bottom line, their offense needs a boost. And while it's a high risk, high reward move to give the keys to a guy that's never coached in the NFL before, I think it's exactly the type of move they needed to make. The other Husky is former UConn Husky Christian Haynes, who I talked up a lot after they drafted him. Mostly because I love UConn. But honestly, I'm just using him as a symbol for the main thing the Seahawks need to improve, and that's just their O line as a whole. They were one of the worst units in the league last year, and that can't happen if you're trying to get the most out of Geno Smith in this offense. Maybe Christian Haynes can help solve their issues, but generally, one guard isn't enough to make up for an overall bad line. So we need some other dudes to step up to. Go Huskies though. The Arizona Cardinals. Kyler Murray returns to form and his connection with Marvin Harrison Jr. makes the Cardinals one of the most deadly offenses in the NFL. Okay, don't laugh but I actually think this one's possible. Not necessarily the Super Bowl implication, even though it's my job to make that argument, but I honestly think the Cardinals will be one of the surprise teams in the NFL this year because of their offense. I think because Kyler got hurt in 2022 and it stretched so far into 2023, people have forgotten just how good he could be when he's at the top of his game. In 2021, Kyler led his offense to a top 10 finish in terms of yards, and the year before that, he was a statistical monster, throwing for just under 4,000 yards and 26 touchdowns, while adding 819 yards and 11 touchdowns on the ground. I don't know if he'll ever get back to that level of Productivity, but I still think he has the ability to be the engine of a very good offense, even if he does run like a toddler who just got caught with a cookie before dinner. And with Marvin Harrison Jr. in the mix now, this connection could be deadlier than Kyler to Hopkins ever was. I mean, we could be looking at the bubonic plague of quarterback receiver duos, and that's without even mentioning the certified psychopath that is Trey McBride. Now, that's the improvement that I actually think is plausible, to win a Super Bowl, though, they're also going to need their offensive line, cornerbacks, and defensive line to not be as awful as they're projected to be. But I like to focus on the positive, so Kyler deep bombs to Marvin, yay! Tampa Bay Buccaneers used some McVay magic to prevent Dave Canales' departure from killing them. Most people expected the Bucs to decline after Tom Brady retired. Instead, Canales engineered a career year from Baker Mayfield, and the Bucs actually improved and won the division for a third year in a row. But now, with Canales off to Carolina to try to resurrect Bryce Young's career, the Bucs are once again in a vulnerable position. But what if, instead of falling off, the Bucs offense actually takes another step forward with their new offensive coordinator and former McVay disciple, Liam Cohen. Cohen was an assistant with the Rams from 2018 to 2020, then became Kentucky's offensive coordinator in 2021, then came back to the Rams to be their offensive coordinator in 2022, where he actually got to work with Baker Mayfield for a bit, then he went back to being Kentucky's offensive coordinator in 2023, before jumping on as the Bucks' offensive coordinator for 2024. Weird path, I know, but the point is he worked with McVay for a while, and typically anyone that shares oxygen with that guy becomes an effective NFL coach. Tampa Bay is going to need that trend to continue if they want to improve on their divisional round exit from last year. The Atlanta Falcons send Kirk Cousins and Raheem Morris on a romantic getaway for bonding purposes. It's not often that a quarterback goes to a new team and immediately wins a Super Bowl, but it can happen. In fact, it's happened a couple times in the last five years, with Tom Brady going to the Bucks and Matthew Stafford going to the Rams. But what happens less often, and by less often, I mean never, is a team winning a Super Bowl the same year they get a new quarterback and a new head coach. When Brady and Stafford did it, Bruce Arians and Sean McVay were already in place, but the Falcons are gonna be trying to integrate an entirely new regime in addition to Kirk Cousins. When you have that many moving parts, it can take a while to get everyone on the same page. So for the Falcons to win a Super Bowl this year, they need Kirk and Raheem to know each other like the back of their hands. And what better way to make sure that happens than to send them on a trip together? They can get a couple's massage, lay out by the pool, go to dinner, all things that can help them get on the same page before the season starts because these two need to be tighter than skinny jeans on Vince Wilfork. The only thing that would help them more is, I don't know, spending the eighth overall pick on a player that can actually help them win a Super Bowl while Kirk's there instead of looking toward the future when you haven't accomplished anything in the present. The New Orleans Saints offense is transformed under new offensive coordinator Clint Kubiak. You're probably noticing a theme here in the NFC South. If these teams want to win a Super Bowl, then coaching is the primary factor. And the reason for that is, even though the Saints and Bucks kept their head coaches, every team in this division at least changed their offensive coordinator. A lot of turnover here in the South. And the Saints needed it as bad as anyone because Pete Carmichael was not getting the job done. This man had about two plays in his bag. Check down to Alvin Kamara or deep shot to Rashid Shaheed. Bringing in Kubiak off the Shanahan coaching tree, he was San Francisco's pass game coordinator last year, is at least some reason for optimism. He's known for using motion more than the Saints did under Carmichael, and he prioritizes getting the ball to his best players. In his one year of OC experience with the Vikings back in 2021, his offense targeted Justin Jefferson 167 times and propelled him to a 1,600-yard, 10-touchdown season. Now, I'm not trying to give Kubiak too much credit for Jefferson's greatness. I'm just saying it's nice that he has enough common sense to pepper his great players with targets, and high-quality targets at that. So hopefully he gives that same treatment to Chris Olave this year, while mixing in a healthy dose of Rashid Shahid and a revamped run game that I'm hoping will be led by Kendra Miller instead of a washed-up Alvin Kamara. Kamara's still valuable in the pass game, but as a runner, he's kind of cooked. In Kubiak, we trust. 
because we really have no other choice. The Carolina Panthers changed their primary color to crimson, so Bryce Young feels like he's back at Alabama. The Panthers signed Dave Canales to a six-year deal, meaning they're expecting this rebuild to take some time. But if we're gonna project a Super Bowl this year, we need to take some drastic measures to get Bryce Young back on track. And what better way to do that than to make him feel like he's back at Alabama? Back before it all went wrong, back when he was the big man on campus, back when he was throwing 40 plus touchdowns in his sleep instead of struggling to throw 11. Yeah, it might be crazy, but if we're trying to turn this team around as quickly as possible, psychologically manipulating Bryce Young into becoming his former self, might be the only way to do it. Besides, Carolina Crimson Tide goes pretty hard. Also, if they're gonna win a Super Bowl, they probably need the defense to drastically outperform their talent level and Jonathan Brooks to lead the league in rushing. That's not too much to ask, right? So there you have it, how every NFC team can win the Super Bowl in 2024. Let me know in the comments who you think is gonna be representing the NFC in the Super Bowl this year. And as always, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.